Well, John, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Well, well, you're a little earlier than I am right now. So you're in over, over in California, and uh, it's, it's about 1030 here. So it's bright and early for you. But I, I take it you're an early riser. Yes, well, at least supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited to have someone on the podcast that I've followed for many years, along with Larry Kotlikoff, which was uh, some, a friend of yours, I take it, yes. that ultimately referred you over to us and said, hey, if you enjoy this conversation with me, you got to talk to John. And that's what we're doing today. And uh, I, I said, well, I'm going to have to kick off this conversation with uh, the Grumpy Economist blog trying to better understand because John, you, you don't seem like the grumpiest guy. And what is it? Seven in the morning or something over there. And you should be grumpy if ever grumpy at this time during the day. So are you a really grumpy guy? What makes you grumpy? No, I'm, I'm not a grumpy guy. Uh, <laughs> by and large, uh, my kids gave me that name when I, uh, one Sunday morning, I was reading a Paul Krugman column in the New York times, one more outrage after another. And I, slammed down my coffee cup and it spilled and they decided to call me the grumpy economist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you're alone in that. You know, we're, we speak with many families and we receive a lot of questions from our fans that seem kind of grumpy, right? They're, they're concerned about inflation and interest rates, not just concerned, but as you said, outraged. You know, they're enraged with what's happening in Washington with the government debt and fiscal policy and monetary policy and and that leads to a lot of frustration. And when I consume your information, your write-ups, your talks, I go, and it, it doesn't seem all that positive. There's not a lot of positivity that I find in some of those articles. You're out there consuming a lot more information as well than the average inf individual. You have a better understanding of economics, and fiscal and monetary policy, and all the different elements that are going on in the world. And that leads you to probably be a little grumpy, I would think. And if that's the case, I want to know, I mean, how do you overcome that? How do you move forward? How do you maintain a positive mindset when you do consume a lot of negative information? That's good. And, and as you mentioned, we, we mix sort of personal lifestyle uh, ideas along with economic ideas uh, here. <laughs> so I'll offer, uh, it is very important in life to keep a positive attitude and, uh, you, you can read, you can get all grumpy when you uh, read a newspaper column you don't like in the morning, but don't let that ruin your day. Uh, by <laughs> and in fact, in, in terms of economics, um, yeah, my writing tends to be grumpy because uh, our country could do so much better uh, if only uh, we weren't doing so many idiotic things. It's, it's kind of easier to stamp out idiocy than it is <laughs> to do great new things. Uh, and that does tend to make you grumpy. But, um, you know, the big picture is uh, we are still uh, a remarkably um, great country. Our economy still does uh, remarkably well, given especially, especially all the idiocy it has to forge ahead against. Um, we are, you know, in, in terms of wealth, productivity, uh, health, long life, and so forth, uh, decline in world poverty. It's actually been a, a wonderful 20, 30 years. So, you know, we can, yes, there's always storm clouds on the horizon, but, um, and, and, and in fact, that, that it has been such a great uh, run of 20, 30 years of, of growth and prosperity leads you to be ever more wishful to preserve this wonderful thing and not let it go under. So don't, don't be grumpy. Look at the bright side when you appreciate things and, and uh, get a little bit grumpy and stamp out stupid stuff when you can. So would it be fair to say that you have a negative near to midterm outlook, but a very positive long-term outlook? Um, oh, I'm, I'm both positive and, and negative about everything. Uh, <laughs> in the near to midterm, uh, you know, there, there are problems. We've we got a war going on that has to be um, managed well. Uh, inflation is certainly um, surging and uh, could lead to a repeat of the 1970s. Um, with, uh, you know, bouts of inflation, stagflation um, could lead to a, a recession, could things could get a lot worse. There's always, always dangers out there. Uh, the long run is, uh, is, is good, but should be better. Um, really, we, we focus on these short run things, inflation that kind of hit us where it should. But um, really, the, the tragedy of the U.S. is that in the late Last half of the 20th century, we were growing about 4% a year, and now we're growing 2% a year. Uh, and since about 2000, now that, that's not 
one politician or another, that's just a, a big slowdown in the overall rate of growth. So, you know, you've got to wait till your, your grandchildren will be as well off as your, as, as your children should be. Well, that's uh, in terms of sort of overall human prosperity, that's really the, uh, the, the striking feature, which, which that's the long run one. And that, that makes me grumpy too. Uh, so good and bad news at all horizons. Well, and I find when I'm visiting with individuals that tend to consume a lot of information, a lot of news articles, a lot of you know, media and a lot of economic reports, et cetera, they tend to become more risk averse over time due to some of those things that they consume. What impact has this had on you? Have you found that the more you learn year after year, day after day, they become more or less risk averse? Or do you let it impact your financial life? and financial decisions at all? No, it, it doesn't uh, really. I, I try to stay rational about <laughs> financial stuff. There is, uh, I think George Will says, I'm, I'm a little bit conservative. I, I mostly call myself libertarian, but conservative libertarian. He, he says the, the, the art of being conservative is to realize that things could always get worse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I do think that risk management is the first uh, key to a good investment strategy in the sense of um, not just how are we going to make a gazillion, but let's make, let's think of all the ways in which things could go wrong and at least make sure that we've, we've got those covered. So um, a proper amount of, of risk aversion is, uh, is appropriate. I, I still, my hobby is I fly airplanes without engines. I fly gliders. <laughs> you really, can't really call me too risk averse. Uh, right. in that sense. And uh, now in, in a financial sense, I, I still, uh, I, I, I hold mostly equities, so um, I, 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 I doubt that conventional advice to act in a more risk-averse way as you get older. Maybe that's a mistake, too. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you talk about being grumpy, and I, I think this, you know, I really wanted to ask a question about your biggest frustrations today. But before we talk about what your current big frustrations are with the economy, and maybe even deeper than that, let's go back to when you were pounding your fist on the table around that, that dining room table with your children so you're you're around the table you're pounding your fist you're upset they start calling you grumpy what was it that had you so worked up at that moment oh i forget it was just some paul krugman column <laughs> <laughs> actually um the original title of it was uh, I, I, I apparently had some sayings that uh, the children found amusing so they wanted to call it I'll put it politely, stuff my dad says. Uh, <laughs> but we settled on the grumpy economist. Well, that's great. What, well, what is your biggest frustration today? Oh, I have too many to <laughs> uh, name, name one of them at all. Uh, in many uh, dimensions of um, economic policy, America seems to be kidding ourselves. And we do seem to be wrapping ourselves into, uh, and it, I think Mark Stein calls us the Republic of Paperwork. Uh, it's it's so imp so hard to get anything built. To, you know, infrastructure. Let's talk about the infrastructure bill. It's not money. It's the, it takes ten years to get the permits to do anything. And, and now I, I can. I, I'm always going to be hopeful. Um, I noticed that even um, you know even the New York Times has noticed that you. That they want to build windmills, but you can't. You're not allowed to build windmills because it takes ten years to get the permits. So, so maybe we'll fix this. You, you know, it's very hard to build houses. Just we seem to be an economy sort of stuck in paperwork and and not moving forward. Uh, maybe that's the the biggest frustration. But I, I got tons of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, and, I, I work on debt, addressing the debt's a problem. Um, I it, pretty much any economic issue you look at, there's a problem. There's uh, a fairly straightforward solution, even bipartisan one sitting on the table, and we can't seem to get moving on it. Mm -hmm. and how do these things impact the way you think about your children? You know, I, I find a lot of the families that we work with, they're not as concerned about their own financial future as they are their children or their grandchildren. What are your biggest concerns for well, your, your four children? Hmm. Well, uh, not particularly financial. They, they all seem to be... Um, making a living. Uh, and, uh, um, but I, uh, you know, one always worries, <laughs> you never stop worrying about your children. Uh, so they're one wonderful people and exploring their lives. And I, uh, you, you could always ce celebrate the great things they're doing and, and, uh, worry about them at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. So you're able to maintain a positive financial outlook for your children, uh, even though you're, you know, have some concerns about the future of government policy and, and kind of where we're headed as an economy. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I want them to live in a, in a vibrant country with many opportunities. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want all of us to live in a vibrant country with many opportunities, uh, and, and not just, you know, the kids of very privileged professors, but the, the kids of people who've come from much harder, uh, much harder places. Yeah, well, that's good to hear that uh, we're we're still positive for our children and our grandchildren. You, know, you talk about being uh, not a free market economist, but in a recent Wall Street Journal article, as I was consuming that, you you talked about being an incentive an incentivist economist. So, what is the difference between an incentivist economist? Please define that for us versus a free market economist. Well, I've, I've learned something from the left, which is be very artful with your words and and invent new ones all the time. <laughs> um, I am a, a free market economist, but I, that, uh, you know, the, I, I think those of us in, in that um, area need to be attentive to marketing. And uh, in some sense, it has a, like supply side has a, a sort of a dated label. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, now this isn't just marketing. Uh, free market is an answer. It's not a question. <laughs> So what is the question to which free markets is the answer? Uh, and one way to wrap it all up in a word is pay attention to people's incentives. Um, and then, it, you know, if, if you, a lot of government policies uh, fall apart because they don't pay attention to the disincentives. If you, uh, this is the paradox of all uh, policy, means-tested policies. If, if you give money so long as people don't work, they end up not taking jobs. Well, there's the disincentive. So let's pay attention to the incentives. Taxes, uh, the standard way of thinking about taxes is who gets money, who who loses money. Uh, I like to first and foremost think about the incentives. Uh, namely, um, you know, if I take if you know, right now in California, if you're a, a wealthy person, you earn an extra dollar, you only keep about uh, thirty cents of it. Well, there's a big disincentive uh, along with an incentive to move to Texas. So uh, now in part, you know, um, who gets money matters, but economists have a lot more to say about the incentives. And that's the part of an economic policy that tends to not get analyzed. Where are the disincentives? Where are the incentives? Uh, That leads you to free marketism. That leads you to realize that markets are better left alone than than run by the government. Uh, So that's that's an attempt at, at branding the general philosophy uh, that, uh, uh, and, and I like to call myself an empirical free marketer as well. I, I like adjectives. Uh, I learned that from the left as well. Uh, but, um, it's important not to be doctrinaire about these things, but instead to, uh, keep in mind the, the weight of evidence and history and logic. Uh, and, but that always tends to lead you back to free markets anyway. <laughs> yeah. And really talking about the precursor to the free market being the incentive. And I had one of my mentors once told me, he said, what, what gets incentivized gets done. And I've lived by that. that it's very true in business. And I think it's very true in the economy. Uh, where does capitalism fit in for you? Could you just give us a high level of view? We've got capitalism. We have free market economists, uh, the free market capital. Just kind of talk about that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Well, here we are on a, we're, we're up in the philosophy department, aren't we? <laughs> I, I don't like to use the word capitalism. I think we know sort of what it means. Uh, it is a word invented by Marx, uh, not by Adam Smith. Um, and it, it focuses on capital, meaning uh, who owns and runs big factory. You know, think of the big 19th century factory with smoke belching out of the... So that's, that's not really the essence of what makes a vibrant uh, opportunity providing growth-oriented society, especially today. Um, our businesses actually need surprisingly little capital. They, they, they just need, you know, a, a, they, well, they don't even need a building anymore. They need smart people mm. with computers. <laughs> Uh, and the vibrancy of a society is the economic growth comes down to better ideas, to, to new ways of doing things, new businesses, uh, new ways of, of serving people's needs better that usually operates best through uh, markets that are left alone to their own desires. That doesn't have a lot to do with 
capital in that classic sense. So um, it, it's 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 a fine word, except it's usually meant. It usually, you know, it, the capitalism, comma the evils of. So if you're starting with that, you're starting at a disadvantage. Let's talk about incentives, opportunity, growth, prosperity, and so forth. Yeah. Well, and where do you think we're headed? I, I was having a conversation with our COO the other day. He's working on something for his dissertation, and this is kind of along those lines. He said, I get a sense that we've lost touch with what made this country great, this entrepreneurial spirit, uh, the spirit of drive and overcoming any obstacles in order to achieve success and create value in the world. Do you feel that the entrepreneurial spirit of this country has shifted and is stifled? Um, is stifled, yes. <laughs> uh, is, I, I tend to resist cultural explanations uh, for things. Uh, now, that doesn't mean culture is unimportant, but let's look at the hundred other things that are getting in the way first. So I, I think this is still a society full of would-be entrepreneurs. It's just getting harder and harder to be an entrepreneur because it's getting harder and harder to get the permits <laughs> and to break into the business. Uh, it's getting harder to fill out all the forms and have the HR compliance department and all the other things it takes to get mm -hmm. a business uh, going. Uh, so I, I think we are... and. and uh, um, there's not only entrepreneurs in the U.S., there's lots of entrepreneurs around the world who would love to move to the U.S. and yeah. start new businesses and hire us and pay our taxes and bail out our government if only we, we would let them do it. So I think uh, within our people, there is that, that desire and that, that – and, and it's still – the U.S. is – for all our troubles, it's still the best place to, to start a business. Um, things are only worse everywhere else. Yeah. Um, so, so, so there's some hope there, but yeah, you know, lots of measures of uh, business formation is doing well. People don't move around as much as they, as they used to. Um, but I think it's just harder in part. It's we've become our, our government has, has become quite stifling and it, one way of, the big picture is we're becoming a government of permission, not a government of rights. And one of the crucial features of American democracy was the protection of your right to do stuff. You, you, if you own a piece of property, you can do what you want with it. You don't have to plead the city council for permission to do stuff with it. And uh, well, that, that leads to a lot of stuff getting done that doesn't get done in a permission society. But we're moving much more to a permissions form of government. Well, that, that slows, everything's just getting slowed down and tied up in the paperwork. Mm -hmm. Well, I get a sense that that's not going to change. I don't know that we've seen any type of rollback when it comes to regulation, roadblocks to economic growth since maybe the 80s. And is that something that can be simplified? We had promises that we would see the tax code get simplified. Didn't see that. It only became more complex. It seems like we just continue to make... Uh, things can more and more complex uh, in the U.S. economy, in the U.S. government, from an IRS perspective, et cetera. Uh, is it possible to actually see some of those uh, things, those barriers break down over time? Do you see I, that in our no, future? No, I think it is quite uh, – certainly um, during the uh, uh, last administration, very quietly under the radar screen where nobody notices and we can get stuff done <laughs> – there was a lot of regulatory reform. Um, the last uh, the last economic report of the president they did kind of outlined a lot of the work they had done. Um, and they, it was very smart about it. Just keep it out of the newspaper so that nobody mm -hmm. knows what's going on. <laughs> of course, a lot of that got turned around as well. That that wasn't very permanent. We have become more and more a government, not even, we, we used to be a, a government of laws, then we became a government of rules by executive agencies. We don't even do that anymore. Now we have just executive orders. And, and the first thing every president does is unwinds the last one's edicts and puts in new ones, uh, which isn't a good way to run things. Uh, but certainly there's, there's, a, uh, there's a large um, crowd waiting for a uh, chance to reform the regulatory state. I think there's a strong legal movement that thinks that uh, this has gone uh, too far. Um, and, uh, you know, we still are a democracy. So when voters get tired of it and, and want it fixed, it'll get fixed. Um, we had the, you know, the 1986 tax, it's probably long ago for you, but I remember it. <laughs> uh, you know, that that's, you can, you can, in a country like ours, sit around, get around the table and say, look, you're going to lose your special deduction. You're going to lose your special deduction, but we're all going to come out ahead in the, in the game. 
it's possible to do that. Many small countries reform, uh, you know, Sweden, and this was back a while ago, but they, they turn into a socialist state and then they say, hmm, it's not working, fix it. Uh, and became a quite, they have high taxes, but they're a quite free market as far as their economic policy. So you got to have hope. I mean, what you, if, if you're saying, ah, it's all going, you're saying democracy's over. Uh, let, let's hope that's not true. Um, so, you know, vote, vote, vote for sensible people and don't vote for dumb people. And, and, you know, we still do have a functioning democracy. And when people demand it to get fixed and vote for politicians who will fix it rather than say other stupid things, then it'll get fixed. Well, I'm That's glad my, we kicked this, this is my off hopeful. With... You want it optimistic. Huh? <laughs> yes, I, think... I was going to say, I'm so glad we kicked this off with grumpy optimism, I might call that. So <laughs> that's fantastic. But let's let's drill down a little bit deeper. And this takes us, I think, perfectly into your new book, uh, The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level, that is set to be published by Princeton in the fall of 2022. Why this topic? Why now? Thank you. I, 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 uh, I was wondering when I get a chance to plug my book, you know. <laughs> well, and I also want to know by the time fall rolls around, is it going to be too late? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I, okay, I will reveal a secret. I, I'm secretly praying for inflation to keep going through the fall. Sorry, the rest. <laughs> of the I need to sell some books. Uh, actually, it has nothing to do with the moment. I, I started working on inflation in 1980. This has been the thing I've worked on academically uh, my whole life. Um, and it, you know, it just took me that long to write the book. Um, it's not, uh, actually, I have to admit, I, I'm fascinated by inflation and monetary policy and debts. And I think that's why I wrote the book because that's what I think I have new and good ideas to share with the world on. It's probably not the most important. The most important thing is long run growth. Never forget the most important thing in economics is long run growth, inflation, recessions, business cycles, nothing else matters but long run growth. But sorry, I don't have anything important and new to say about long run growth. I could just, uh, you know, channel my buddy Chad Jones here with, and, and the other great growth economists. Uh, I have something to say about inflation. So that's where I wrote a book about inflation. Actually, I turned in the manuscript uh, to Princeton at this introduction saying, well, you know, inflation stuck at 2%. We haven't seen it for 20 years. So maybe someday it'll come back and someone will care about this book. Uh, and then things changed. I, I got to write a new introduction pronto. <laughs> Yeah, perfect timing here. Perfect timing, really. Uh, and I, I, timing. Yeah, well, it, it's really a, a new take on inflation. And I really want you to talk about your theory uh, that government debt is a core driver of inflation. Yeah, which is, it's, I got it. It's a new theory and an old theory. So, you know, in, in terms of the words, uh, the book starts with a quote from Adam Smith, who recognize the basic idea, but it is so basically here is the question. Okay. We're going to get a little nerdy for a minute. Okay. Please. <laughs> Where does basically inflation come from? Uh, which is the same question as, is, you know, dollars are just pieces of paper. Why do we work so hard for these pieces of paper that cost the government about two cents to make them zero for the government to make the electronic pieces of paper that we work just as hard for. Where's the value? Why, why do people care so much about this money? Um, why, why do we uh, work so hard for a worthless good? And why does it become more worthless? It'll work closer to worthless sometimes when we get inflation and deflation. So that's the big, it's kind of like the big economic question. And uh, the theory that this book starts with is that fundamentally it's um, money is a form of government debt. Uh, government debt is just a promise to print money and give it to you. So those are all united. Money and government debt are all the same thing. And so what gives government debt the value? Well, people's expectations that sooner or later it'll get paid off in something worthwhile, that the government will um, will at some point run surpluses in order to be able to pay off its debts. That's make the debts valuable. If you think the government is is never going to solve its deficit problems, let me advise you to get rid of your government debt. How do you get rid of government debt? You buy stuff. You try to buy stuff, you get inflation. So that's uh, that shouldn't be too um, crazy. What's what's uh, and I think that idea is in there, uh, but that is uh, from an academic point of view. That's a, it's a quite different fundamental view. For uh, for example, it it. Um, the standard view is that money matters, but money relative to government debt. 
So does it matter if the government issues more debt and less money, but more money and less debt with the same deficit? Well, I'd say to first order, no. So that's a sense of, of how it matters. So that, that's the guiding principle and the basic idea of the book. So in layman terms, I, I am not an economist, uh, but I would rephrase that, and I'm probably going to get this totally wrong, but as this government debt continues to accumulate, uh, the general individuals are going, hey, we're never going to pay off that debt. Taxes aren't going to go up so that they can pay off that debt. If that debt is never going to get paid, then why am I going to hold that debt? I'm not going to buy that debt. I'm not going to uh, you know, keep my assets in government debt. I'm going to take those assets and move them somewhere else. I'm going to spend them or I'm going to invest them in different areas of the market, real estate or stocks, et cetera. And that is the core driver of inflation. This lack of confidence that the government debt actually gets paid off in the future makes me want to spend those dollars today. Yeah, it's the, the amount of debt relative to your guess about um, is it going to get paid off? And that's, that's so that that's makes it a difficult theory because how much, you know, when do people lose faith in the government? Mm, that's a uh, that's hard to independently uh, measure. And it is it's something you asked me, you know, what keeps me up at night <laughs> It's this. It points to a mechanism that that can sort of snowball. Um, uh, it's sort of like a bank. Big inflations are kind of like bank runs. So sort of out of nowhere, everyone says, you know, I see you uh, saying, well, I, I don't trust them anymore. I say, maybe I don't either. And then then we all kind of uh, then, then the currency goes and inflation kind of comes out of nowhere, as it sometimes seems to come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. So so is this a fear of default that the average individual has or the institutional investor has in the to the same degree yeah it, it can either if you if you fear either defo- so what happens what happens on our current trajectory right now we have immense uh, debt as you know uh, the debt is growing and there is no plan to pay it off uh, and uh, in a couple of years uh, social security medicare and all sorts of other promises that the government has made uh, kick in uh, now there's a hard choice. Either you, you raise taxes, which is going to be really hard to do, or you cut the spending, which is going to be really hard to do, or you explicitly default, which could happen even in the U.S., or when the time comes, they simply print more dollars to pay off the current debt, um, uh, dollars that don't pay interest, and, and then you get... Now, if you see that inflation coming in the future, get rid of your government bonds today. That's what rolls it back to... Uh, that, that fear about the future rolls it back to today. And... Um, since our government uh, has short-term debt, you don't really need, your vision doesn't have to be everyone's thinking about 20 years in the future. Um, really, if, if you just think, uh, you know, most people who hold government today, debt today hold it for a year or two thinking, well, there'll be somebody to roll that debt over. And once you start worrying about that, then, then trouble breaks out. The, the basic view, you know, this is a finance show. So what gives a stock its value? Stock's value is the present value of of future earnings, right? Uh, What gives a bond its value? The bond's value is the present value of the future coupon payments and the terminal payoff. What gives government debt its value? The present value of the future surpluses that are used to retire the debt. So it's really just take asset pricing 101 uh, and apply that to the government and you come up with that's, that's all the fiscal theory the price level is. And would it be fair to say that this is, you know, being a core driver would be synonymous with leading indicator, and that might be the explanation as why, you know, we saw an expansion of monetary policy from 2008 till today, but it took 15 years for us to actually see the impact of that? I think no. Uh, I think actually um, monetary policy from 2008 till today wasn't that expansionary. So, um uh, yeah, interest rates were low, but um, so was inflation. Uh, the QE business, I don't think, did much good or bad in either direction. Um, remember, what they did is they took treasuries and, and gave you back uh, reserves. That's what QE is. And I, I think of that as like, I, I take your quarters and I give you two dimes and a nickel. So that's not going to make you spend a whole lot. Uh, fiscal policy was expansive, but um, uh, it was in a, in a period where uh, I, th- I think there, the, the very low interest rates of the 2008 uh, to 2020 period helped a lot for the government to finance deficits. Uh, as I look at inflation right now, now here's where I put my fiscal theory hat on. Uh, I see the immense uh, fiscal and monetary expansion of the uh, last recession. 
Um, the government, uh, we had $5 trillion of deficit. It put, the total government debt was $17 trillion uh, as of, I think, February 2020. And we uh, printed up about $3 trillion of money and sent people checks. We borrowed another $2 trillion of money and sent people checks. So that uh, very fast um, uh, fiscal expansion, that, that uh, huge deficit, I think, is the reason that we're seeing inflation right now with, with only a one-year lag. Well, you're starting to throw out some some numbers when it comes to debt, and uh, there was a, a criticism of your work in a recent Wall Street Journal opinion article. I'm sure you saw it. Uh, I'm one that can't avoid reading my reviews. Uh, Professor Shiva Rajgopal of Columbia Business School uh, said that well, you're only focusing on the government's $20 trillion in on-balance sheet debt and overlooking the off-balance sheet debt of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, arguing that if that was taken into consideration, inflation expectations should be three times higher. What's your response to that? Oh, well, and, and Larry Kotlikoff, who you mentioned earlier, makes, makes this point. Uh, uh, not only does the government uh, have this now 20-some, two, three trillion of official debt, uh, it has promised to pay all sorts of things with no ways to pay for them, which is sort of an unofficial debt. Uh, I, I think he's right. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I, I think um, uh, that didn't particularly get worse in the last year or two. Um, and I think that is, uh, in the end, if this turns into sort of the big, the moment, a moment has to come of a fiscal reckoning for the U.S. Uh, that, that's just budget just just the fact of numbers add up <laughs> we cannot kick this can down the road forever and that moment a lot of that moment is that we've made all these promises that we have uh, that our government has no way of keeping uh, now I, i'm not sure it's productive to think that of debt as it is it's, it is different from the on budget debt. you cannot go down to the social security administration and say you guys have no way of raising this money so i want mine in a lump sum right now <laughs> Uh, but you can go to the treasury and say, I've got all these treasury bonds. Uh, you guys have no way of raising this money. I want it now. You just sell them. But you can't sell your Social Security. You can't sell your Medicare. You can't. Those are not marketable debts. So mm -hmm. that whole mechanics of I'm going to run away. I'm going to run. I'm going to dump those things and, and drive their price down. That that doesn't happen to Social Security debt. It's a, I think it's better thought of as a, a promise to pay that will get resolved. And I think, frankly, it's going to get resolved by cutting benefits. Um, mm. That's the way other countries do it. When, when, when the time comes that the, that you run into a debt crisis. Um, now that's, there's uh, the U S you know, I don't want to throw a gram, you know, you're heartless, throw a gram off the train. No. Um, uh, I, I think our, our assists, our social welfare system um, could be reformed to give people the money who need it a lot more effectively and, and waste a lot less money. Um, but uh, that, that's, I think, now, now if, if you think that's what's going to happen, that's not quite the same mechanics as, as this debt that, uh, you know, when, when, when the Chinese and, and everybody else dumps our debt, that's, that's a quick problem. That's a different problem than sort of people lose faith that Social Security is going to be there when they retire. So a correlation, but not a direct correlation. And this brings me directly to interest rates. Uh, so can the Fed control inflation by rising interest rates? If it's directly correlated, if inflation, if the government debt is a direct uh, correlator for inflation, if we raise interest rates, aren't we enhancing the amount of government debt and only furthering inflation? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, I do think buried in here, uh, well, not even buried in here, there, a, a reevaluation is coming. You know, we, we take for granted that the Fed is enormously powerful and, and can control inflation. That's a new idea. <laughs> That's now new. Uh, well, this is a, a show for people thinking about retirement, so for whom 1965 isn't that long ago. Uh, but there was a time even through the 1970s where people didn't think the Fed had that much to do with inflation at all. <laughs> Uh, and well, now, now, so now we think, oh yeah, higher interest rates, lower interest rates, that's everything. Well, if the Fed has limited powers to uh, affect inflation, it does have quite a bit of power to affect inflation, but uh, especially when, as you're saying, if the fundamental inflation comes from fiscal policy, then the Fed has limited ability to, to fix it. I, as a metaphor, 
Uh, you know, the Fed, the Fed is about liquidity, right? So if the uh, fiscal policy is, you, you, the car is going too fast down the freeway, fiscal policy is the accelerator stuck to the floor. The, the Fed can drain some oil out of the car. That'll slow it down. It's not a very effective way to slow it down. And, and the fundamental problem is still that the accelerator is stuck to the floor. And you said something very deep, which uh, I appreciate because it took me a couple of years to get to that understanding. <laughs> the Fed's ability to cool the economy by raising interest rates is limited by fiscal policy. And uh, I'll just draw out what you said. Um, if the Fed raises it, suppose the Fed raises interest rates to five percent. Now, my, my colleague John Taylor of the Taylor Rule says interest rates should be about nine percent. You got seven percent inflation. You need interest rates higher than inflation in order to tamp down inflation. So, so the the, the Fed is going on a forecast that almost all this inflation is going to go away its own. It only has to raise interest rates to two to three percent for the interest rates to be higher than inflation. No, you know, watch out. <laughs> Uh, the rule is for the Fed to lower inflation. Interest rates have to be higher than inflation. So if inflation does not mostly go away on its own, uh, we're, we're going to see some big interest rate rise. But will that even work? Getting to the point. <laughs> if the Fed raises interest rates to 5, 6, 7, 8, 10%, that raises the interest costs on the debt. And those are big now. That means we have another trillion or more dollars on the deficit then the whole debt problem gets worse. And the debt problem was what's driving the inflation in the first place. So you can, some, Brazil has seen this dynamic. If you have an inflation that's being driven by too much deficits and you just raise interest rates, that makes the deficits worse. And that can make, it can make the inflation worse. So the Fed, mm. so I'm up here. Uh, you can tell I used to be a professor. Uh, for the Fed to uh, lower inflation by raising interest rates, it has to raise interest rates substantially. And we need at the same time fiscal policy to contract fiscal policy. You have to pay off the, the higher interest costs on the debt, or you have to convince people that you're going to pay them in the future, which is kind of the whole problem. Uh, so the Fed is limited in its powers in a, in a bunch of ways. And one way is that uh, uh, it's going to need fiscal policy to go with it. So let's have you pull out that crystal ball. Uh, what do you expect to see? I, and right now, we've, you could argue we're seeing pretty dramatic uh, projections from the Fed of what they're going to do with interest rates going from a quarter point to a half a point to one. I mean, th those are pretty substantial. That's 100% oh, increase. No, they're not. In it's 7% inflation. Well, exactly. It's Relative to 7% inflation, quarter one is, is like, you know, we're, we're goofing around here. Yeah, but you say, well, it's 100% increase in interest rates. But that's all relative at the end of the day, relative. right? Now, the Fed may be right. This may all uh, go away before they actually have to do anything more than symbolic about it. So anyway, go, go ahead. Well, what, what do you envision? And um, you know, take what you envision uh, versus what you would do if you were chairman. Thank God I'm not chairman. Uh, people <laughs> are, are doing a, uh, they're, they're doing a very hard job. And I, I, uh, uh, I, I shy away from making forecasts because I, I tend to be wrong. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a good advice for all of us. So this is um, a, a, an advice I showed. Some well, extent. let's digress there for just a moment. And because there are individuals that are trying to consume this information from economists and economic it's, it's, projections are all over the board, right? Everyone has a different opinion, and some are starkly different than others. How would you guide uh, a retiree in consuming or anybody in consuming that information and acting on it? Well, I, I think what you just said is the most important thing. Opinions are all over the board. So um, always start with risk management. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the When opinions are all over the board, that means there is genuine uncertainty about what's going on. Uh, that means none of your experts really know. So the strategy of pick one expert and, and go with that as if it's absolute certainty is a bad strategy. Uh, recognize that lots of different things could happen and nobody really knows, and you need a, a robust strategy that's going to keep you through it. Uh, inflation could well, there's a very clear scenario that we could be just starting off where it's 1972. <laughs> We, the Fed has announced a monetary policy that looks exactly like what they did in the 1970s, that they will respond very slowly to inflation. They're, they are behind the 1970s curve. In the 1970s, they actually did raise interest rates much more quickly with inflation than they're doing now. 
Uh, we just had an, an oil price shock and a little war, hopefully not a big war. Uh, so and, and and kind of the same sort of Washington. We we could be heading down, or or we could not, or. Powell could be right. This could all just be a one-time price level increase that all melts away and we go back to zero interest rates zero and, and fighting deflation. Uh, I, I tend to think that inflation is breaking out will be more long lasting, uh, but uh, let's recognize lots of different things can happen. So your investment strategy, don't put all your eggs on 32 black and spin the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Diversify, well uh, be robust. Well, I, I like it. We've chosen our one economist here. We're, we're going to run with that. But let, let's put you in that chair. So you are now chairman. What do you do today? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to squeeze. I got to wiggle out of this one, too. Uh, uh, I, I, I do think, um, first of all, I'm going to find out why in the heck did the Fed's inflation, why did the Fed miss this so badly? This was a huge institutional, I mean, the Fed, Failure. The Fed's number one job is to see inflation coming and do something about it, and they were caught totally flat-footed. So it's clear that their their methods for forecasting inflation are. Second, I would not put so much faith in in the going forecast going forward. The Fed has put they did done what I have just described. They put all their chips on thirty-two black. They said the forecast is that um, uh, the inflation is going to go away. So here's our our list of interest rate responses. I, I think you. Uh, now they're starting to say that. I, I heard some hints in Powell's testimony. If inflation keeps going, we could deviate from this path um, and and start moving faster. But the problem is, you know, the inflation that's coming is a joint fiscal and monetary policy, so it's not just in in the Fed's uh, in the Fed's hands. Mm -hmm. Well. When it comes to the stock market, it seems like there's also a divergence in opinions there as well. When it comes to shifts in infl inflation, interest rates, you say, well, the stock market should do well. It should be doing well. That's why inflation is going up. That's why they're also having, having to raise interest rates. Um, what are your expectations if we do enter an inflationary environment and a rising interest rate environment for a, a long period of time? What will the impact be on the equity market and the fixed income market? And the other thing that's even harder to forecast is stocks. So you've got to remember, um, <laughs> the stock market, too, the price is set where exactly half of the people think it's going up and half the people think it's going down. And, uh, um, uh, you know, half of them are wrong. I just don't know which half. <laughs> uh, we can certainly do some if, if and then. So we do know that the stock market is sensitive to, to interest rates. So if real interest rates rise, uh, that is going to lower the level of the stock market. Uh, if the economy tanks, that's going to lower the stock market. The, some of the worst years for the stock market were, were 1974. There wasn't a big crash, but it went down 40% in the year. So stagflation, I, I think, is something we would worry about. As much for the inflation itself, I mean, stocks are supposed to be real assets that maintain their value during inflation. So why did stocks mm -hmm. do badly during the time of inflation? Well, I think because, you know, correlation versus causation, um, inflation is always a time of economic chaos, uh, financial chaos, uh, government chaos. Uh, so uh, stocks do badly in times uh, of, of economic, uh, financial and regulatory chaos, not because of the inflation per se. Uh, there's a temptation for governments to fight inflation with very damaging taxes. Corporate taxes in particular, that's not good for the stock market. With, with measures that, that really hurt the economy, that would hurt the stock market. So you're not really worried about in stocks, which are supposed to be an inflation hedge. It's not so much the inflation itself as, as the uh, bad policies that are causing inflation and that are going to be used to counterproductively uh, do things about it. I mean, you look at our government and the list of narratives uh, about inflation uh, straight out of the Middle Ages. First, it was the hoarders, and then the price gougers, and then greed, and then the corporations, and then it's all Putin's fault. But I mean, no one's talking about monetary and fiscal policy, which is where inflation comes from. So there's a great desire to do uh, everything else but what might actually uh, hurt. So, oh, sorry, you asked about the stock market. Didn't you? <laughs> higher, so uh, higher interest rates uh, will generally bring stock markets down. Now, we're long-term investors, I hope most people listening to us. So one, this is one of the big things we learned about the stock market in, uh, in the last 20 years is it is actually a good deal like the bond market. 
that when, when prices go down relative to dividends and earnings, there is a tendency for those prices to come back up over like a five-year period. So if you can afford to hold on, it's really not as much bad news as it sounds. The same way if, if you're holding a long-term bond and you're holding it till maturity, uh, if the price goes down, the yield goes up. So, you know, in the end, you'll be okay. Uh, and there's a similar, there's a similar don't worry about it so much for stock markets if, if you're a long-term investor. Hmm. Okay, well, let's hit on tax rates before we close this thing up. Yeah, so, so you talked about government debt and us just not having the confidence uh, as a society that we're going to see that government debt get paid off. Uh, but I've had other guests on that say, well, we're going to see a dramatic increase in tax rates in the future because we have to in order to pay down the government debt and continue to fill, fulfill the entitlement program. So is your sense that we are not going to see a dramatic increase in taxes in the future or otherwise? Yeah, well, there's this conundrum. We have a European welfare state and the and, uh, tax system doesn't pay for it. Um, we're not as far off as you think because uh, we have federal, state, local, uh, and sales taxes. So you add all that up, there's actually quite a bit of taxes, but not enough to pay for all the benefits. So where's the money coming from is a good question. Um, I think the economic reality of it is that sharply higher tax rates in the current tax system will not do the trick. Um, if you do the, the all in top marginal tax rate in the state of California is about 60 to 70%. You can't really raise taxes much more than that. <laughs> uh, so the idea will just tax the rich or tax the corporations or tax somebody else. There is just not enough money there, uh, at, at, uh, at non, at, at tax rates that keep the economy going. So what does Europe do? Uh, Europe has value added tax. You want to pay for 55% of GDP benefits like France does. Uh, you have a uh, basic, you have a 40% payroll tax and a 25%, 20 to 25% sales tax on everything. You have middle-class taxes for middle-class benefits. That's the way Europe goes. Uh, and I think the economic reality is that if America wants uh, that level of, of benefits, that's the kind of tax it's going to have to have. And we have, you know, uh, a lot of our taxes are implicit in a in a massively um, uh, complicated system. Like Europe charges taxes and gives you health care. We have health insurance, mandatory health insurance, but it's about the same amount of money. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, the the way to how do you the, how do you square the circle? You think outside the box. The the right answer to this is growth. Where the where the government the government needs tax revenue doesn't need taxes. It needs tax revenue. What's the difference? Tax revenue is tax rate times income. So how do you get more tax revenue? Well, you can try more tax rate, but if you raise the tax rate, people start working, start working, the economy falls apart and the income goes down. Maybe not one for one, but it's like climbing up. It's like climbing up a sand dune. Every step up you take, you're going to slip back because every time you raise tax rates in the current system, the economy falls a little bit and you get less revenue out of it. How about let's unleash uh, uh, economic reform and let growth go nuts? So a growth-oriented uh, reform would give you a lot of tax, a lot of more income, a lot more GDP, and incidentally, even with the same tax rates, you get a lot more revenue. Also, if the economy grows like crazy, a lot less people need the help. People would prefer to work than to re receive checks from the government. Uh, well, th th that's that's a just the right way all around. So actually the solution to our taxes, I'm all for a tax reform. We have a tax system that raises remarkably little revenue at very high rates because it's full of Swiss cheese, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages, keeps tax lawyers and accountants and lobbyists busy all day long. So definitely, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna, when we face reality, we need a, actually a lower the marginal rates, broaden the base kind of tax reform. But economic growth is the answer to uh, to squaring the circle rather than having a very painful uh, economy killing period of austerity or or throwing grandma off the back of the train with with painful de benefit cuts. So why control inflation at all? Why not let us inflate our way out of the debt? Oh, thank you for asking that. Our problems will not be solved. Our problem is not a debt problem. Uh, our problem is, in fact, as Larry Kotlikoff was on the show saying, it's a it's it's a no plan for paying off the debt plan. And in fact, our plans are to keep borrowing more and more and more. 
Uh, so if you default on the debt, which is what inflation does, you do not solve this problem that, so, that every year we now have a trillion dollar deficit. Every crisis, we have a $5 trillion stimulus and bailout blowout, and then comes Social Security and Medicare. That's all in the future. And so inflating, inflating away or defaulting on our current debt, in fact, makes all that worse because we would lose the capacity to borrow money at all. No one lends you money the day after you wealth on your debts. No one lends you money. So inflating our, our debt away would, would make the fundamental fiscal problem worse, uh, not better. You can borrow 100% of GDP as we have if you have a plan to pay it off. You can borrow tremendous amounts of money if you have a good plan to pay it off. Uh, welching on your past debt is not a way to get a plan to pay it off. <laughs> so you discussed your investment strategy a little bit. You talked about taxes. Uh, wh what type of tax strategy do you implement today or the way that you think about investing and saving from a tax perspective in order to safeguard yourself against the risks we may face in the future? Yeah, well, I'm personally nowhere near good, as, good about this as I should be. But um, <clears throat> certainly, let, let's just say, doing wise, uh, wise, but not too clever, let's not go to jail, please, things about taxes <laughs> is, is the most important part of an investment, especially the long run investment strategy. Why? Because it's free. <laughs> uh, you know, in my life in, as a finance professor, everyone's all, oh, let's find alpha, let's find the great manager who'll make us a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot more money to be had by by doing things you know from a sound tax perspective you know simple examples uh when you sell stuff you pay capital gains so don't sell stuff don't pay cap don't pay short-term capital gains uh why any never sell anything less than a year from when you bought it you don't know for sure about where it's going i mean unless you, unless you got really good reasons uh that's just a tax efficiency that's easy to get of course talk to your estate tax estate tax lawyer uh you know look on the margin, 50%, that's a huge bite. Uh, let's, and, and there's, I, I referred to the Swiss, corrupt Swiss cheese of a tax code. Well, you know, they're offering this to you. So, uh, you know, and, and there I'm not an expert, but, you know, it's still, our ta you have to understand our tax system. Like so much of America, a fancy, a fancy word is price discrimination by needless complexity. Let me, let me <laughs> unpack that for you. Uh, the way things work is that um, it's, it's like, the whole, the whole system is like airline frequent flyer miles or, or credit card rewards. Uh, if you're willing to take the time and really dig into it, uh, you can save a lot of money. Otherwise, they're going to screw you. That's a technical term. And so tax, taxes are the same way. It's deliberately set up to be complicated and opaque. Why? So that people don't take the time and effort. They take your money. Uh, so um, that was sort of more an ode to tax efficiency. Uh, you know, the basic principles are, are do good estate tax planning so it doesn't all go away when you die. Uh, try not to sell things, avoid capital gains. Those are sort of basics. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave your tax experts to tell you all the other tips and tricks. But um, it's sort of the first, the first stage is risk. Before we get into what's the next hot idea, risk management, listen to a lot of ideas, recognize that uh, for every buyer, there's a seller. The average investor holds the market portfolio. We can't all be smarter than average. Half of the people who think they are are deluded. Uh, so risk management, uh, second step, don't pay too many taxes. Third step, we can talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> well, I think we've wrapped this conversation up with the common sense guidance that we're looking for. Let's just skip on over and wrap it up with a question from one of our fans. So our weekend reading subscribers, they submit questions to us prior uh, to our guests coming on the show. And we had a question that I think is very relative to the conversation here today from Tom. Uh, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about this question. I'll read it off and then I'll really show us where to focus uh, in the where I think we haven't really touched on yet. Uh, Tom says, our national debt is a huge elephant in the room that no one seems to be addressing, which you have addressed. Uh, this has me concerned as to the stability of the dollar being used as a world currency. How can I as an investor be proactive in dealing with this so that inflation doesn't clobber us all? I really just want to focus on, I, th I think we talked about inflation. We talked about the elephant in the room, but we really haven't talked much about currency. Uh, could you touch on the dollar and currency and maybe even throw some cryptocurrency thoughts in there. Oh gosh. You wanted a short answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, if you're an American investor, most of the stuff you buy is in dollars. So you don't care all that much uh, about the currency. And of course the dollar is relative to everyone else. 
So in a sense, uh, you know, I think the event to fear is, is a global uh, inflation, a global sovereign debt crisis. Um, you know, wh where's the next bubble coming from? Well, with, what's the one no one's talking about? Where's there a lot of debt that no one knows how to repay? That's sovereign debts, and that's China's sovereign debts, and Europe's sovereign debts, and America's sovereign debts. So it's not clear we're in worse shape than anyone else. Uh, and the dollar relative to other things is is likely to go down. In fact, usually in times of crisis, the dollar goes up first because uh, because people, uh, you know, in other countries are in worse shape than we are. Now, nah, this last recession didn't really work out that way. So I think there is there is some beginnings of warning signs that the uh, the, the dollar won't always be the safe haven, that in, in bad times, dollars might go down as well. Um, uh, but if like I said, number one, most of the things you want to buy in dollar are in dollars. If you're a U.S. consumer, it's not that much of an issue. Uh, um, the dollar being the world's currency is uh, it's it's of limited benefit to you as an investor. Um, it means uh, Uncle Sam gets to borrow I don't know maybe another trillion bucks for free, but we've already borrowed that, so I'm not sure it's <laughs> doing us an enormous amount of good. I think there's a lot of reason to worry about it. Um, you know, the, the recent we're using sanctions a lot, uh, and and it's be like a very powerful weapon right now against Russia, but but everyone notices. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people around the world are saying, oh, the U.S. government might freeze my accounts. I think I might need accounts somewhere else. Um, so I, I think that that is in motion, but I, I, I don't see it as having a first order effect other than sort of global chaos, the danger of global chaos and inflation, which is still a small, uh, you know, we're talking risk management here. Uh, it's, it's still, a, I'm not saying go out and put all your money in gold bars and uh, so hide them in the basement, uh, it, but it's a it's a small but substantial risk to to worry about. So you uh, believe in a large part the dollar will remain the global currency. I think dollars will remain. Uh, there's a danger of an inflation, uh, which is the main danger for you is inflation. Whether the dollar is a global currency or not, I don't think the average investor really should care about. I mean, the average investor who has a lot of Swiss francs is doing just fine, thank you, and doesn't care whether Swiss francs are the global currency or not. Uh, <laughs> I do think there's a, I think that that motion is underway. Um, it's kind of puzzling. You know, things can be quoted in dollars, but people don't have to hold a lot of dollars. Uh, and I think actually we may head that direction um, uh, because it's very, it's very easy to change money, even large amounts of, of money around. Uh, so I think this is a sort of a nebulous thing that um, uh, we need to define our terms and have a whole show about uh, mm. uh, if you want to. Man, what, what role would, would, sorry, go ahead. What role would cryptocurrency play in global currency markets, if any? Uh, well, crypt cryptocurrency is as a perpetual answer in search of a question. And, mm -hmm. and again, there's like five flavors of cryptocurrency. There's, there's Bitcoin, which is a claim to nothing, an attempt to, to recreate gold. Uh, and there's then the stable coins, which is are a way of recreating the money market mutual fund. Uh, so there's nothing really new in economics or finance. There's some interesting new technology. So what is crypto right now? The main thing it offers is anonymity, uh, and that's actually uh, uh, anonymous. That that's sort of the big financial issue. Uh, are can you have anonymous transactions? Uh, and um, so one of the central component of economic and political and personal freedom is: Are you allowed to buy or sell without the government knowing about it or controlling it? And and crypto crypto right now, you know, what's the main use for? You want to get money out of Ukraine? Crypto is a good way to do it. You want to get money out of Russia? Crypto is a good way to do it. You want to get money out of China, Venezuela, Argentina? Crypto is a good way to do it. Uh, you want to avoid paying taxes? You want to do some ransomware? You want to you know, be a, uh, a drug runner and, and get money around? Crypto is a good way to do it. So really, that, that's, that's the use case right now. Uh, that's not going to unseat the dollar, but I, I think it has a very important impact. Now, now, governments are going to try to clamp down on that sort of thing. And uh, we're, that, this is, I think... Where do we go with the need for a digital dollar for digital payments, uh, but to preserve some amount of uh, privacy and, and right to do what you want? And, you know, like the Canadian truckers who found their bank accounts frozen when they mounted a political protest, discovered um, uh, that, uh, you know, government-run digital currencies pose some privacy risks. That's, that's going to be a, 
it's a hard night because you want to be able to collect taxes and, and you want to be able to fight crime, but you also need to maintain some ability to, to move your money around freely. Uh, that's going to be, you, you want, you want a, a, a hard policy problem. That's going to be one to think about and, and also for you as investors. Well, John, I look forward to reading your new book and much more that is on the horizons for you. It's been enlightening. It's been intriguing. John, how could someone, what's the best way to follow you, get in touch with you, make sure that uh, they're getting all the latest and greatest from Dr. Cochran? Yes. Uh, so um, uh, I have a blog, The Grumpy Economist, that you mentioned. If you Google my name, John Cochran, you find, uh, with an E on the end, you find my website, which has uh more publications for, for this audience. I just wrote a paper I'm very proud of called Portfolios for Long-Term Investors, which has uh, all words and no equations, a new first for me, uh, and is trying to put together my summary of what my years of learning about uh, asset prices has to say about how, how we do investing. You might find that useful. So uh, just Google my name. And for the moment, I still come up first and I haven't been banned from the internet yet. Well, and that is a great article. We'll make sure to include all those links in the show notes. You can check it out at retirewithpurpose.com. John, thank you for joining us on the show. Look forward to next time. Thank you.